scientists and policymakers have to be clearer about the consequences of deforestation and the consequences of another epidemic. But similarly, scientists have to think more like businessmen and say, can we come up with solutions for this that people can invest in so as the solution stops the bad thing happening, but does so in a way that generates job and income for people who are prepared to invest in it. And that requires more interactions between ecologists who are thinking, you know, which won't be lumped in with environmentalists and economists, and perhaps also with sort of business people and entrepreneurs to sort of say, how can we develop economic models that are going to create huge incentives for doing sensible things rather than corrupting incentives for doing bad things. Professor Andrew P. Dobson is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Andy was born in London and moved to live in Scotland before starting school. He spent the next 15 years becoming a keen bird watcher. He commuted daily from a small village on the edge of the Highlands to Glasgow High School. His family moved to Essex in 1970 and he completed school at King Edward VI Grammar School, Clemsford, where he spent a lot of time measuring a museum collection of bird eggs and trying to quantify changes in their shape and size. He went to Imperial College London University as a botanist and emerged as a zoologist in 1976. He then went to Oxford for his PhD on the mortality rates of British birds. During his time as a graduate student, he worked as a sous chef at the Cherwell Boathouse Restaurant. This generated a lifetime interest in food and its production. He was then a postdoc back at Imperial with Roy Anderson working on the population dynamics of host parasite relationships, work which led him to Princeton to work on a combination of all of the above with Bob May. He was hired at the University of Rochester in 1987 and after three years returned to Princeton in 1990. He lives there as a member of the ecology and evolution faculty ever since. Andy's research focuses on the role that infectious disease plays in the dynamics of wild animal and plant populations and how this modifies the structure of food webs. Thinking about how to develop mathematical models for these problems takes him to Serengeti, Yellowstone, Panama, and along the coast of California. He also works on assorted problems in conservation, biology, and models for animal social systems and how these interact with the dynamics of different pathogens. This work is based on the wolf population in Yellowstone, but gains insights from the lion studies in the Serengeti and a long-term fascination with primate, primate social systems. Andy has published and edited several books, Conservation and Biodiversity, Population Dynamics of Disease in Natural Population, and unsolved problems in ecology. He has been an external faculty member at the Santa Fe Institute since 2011. Increasing his time there will be spent writing a series of books that provide introductions to the scientific systems he has studied. Serengeti lives, parasite lives, Yellowstone uh, lives or lives. He's part of the SFI, Arrow of the Time, working group that is examining time scales and immunity. Andy, I hope it's okay to call you that instead of Professor Everybody Dobson. <laughs> yeah. um, welcome to the well, show. You. That was very long uh, introduction, but I know I could say probably 12 other pages of things. You've, you've been around for a while, uh, uh, as I have, uh, um, so you've seen many parts of the world and you've done amazing works. Um, just uh, as, as a quick extra introduction, what brings you here 
today, uh, not only your, your great generosity, but I uh, came across the paper that you and Dr. Stuart Pym uh, wrote together um, and was published in The Guardian, Ecology and Economics for Pandemic Prevention. I also had Dr. Pym on the show and we had a wonderful discussion and uh, your, your name came up several times and, and before that, and I, I wanted to do both of you a little bit separate on a podcast because I know there's so much we could deep dive into. Um, the, the other real reason is because of your food background. I don't know how much you, you know about me, but I'm uh, extremely big in, in, in food, global food reform, food systems. And so that, that is really why I wanted you to, to come on the show as well, so that we could have a deeper dive in that after we address the, you know, the pandemic and COVID-19 and some of the, the things that you brought out in, in, in your paper. I also have a book coming out called Menu B, People and Planet Food Saving Solutions. It talks a lot about biodiversity and things like that. And so um, I, I think it's, a, it's really fitting and I'm honored to have you here. So, Again, welcome, and it's, it's so wonderful that uh, you could take the time out of your busy schedule to, to, to be with us. It's only my pleasure. And I, Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and I should just start off with the start, so, say that the, the, the paper with, with Stuart was actually a whole consortium of, of, of us that, that, that worked on that. So it's so some wonderful people uh, from all over the world, uh, and, and we sort of brought that group of, together because they had the, the, the expertise to dig into the different types of topic that have to be looked at to sort of make that sort of synthesis. Yes, that's true. And, and um, out of that consortium, uh, we actually, there, there was a coordinator for that entire publication. And, and uh, the two that I was absolutely most interested in having were you, were you and, and Stuart. And so it worked out perfectly and I think the other ones maybe are too big a rock stars and busy for for our time. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it was a fabulous paper and, and um, w we're going to get into a, a little bit of what my thoughts and feelings on that were and, and how you came about and, and what your inputs were that we'll dissect that. But with your long biography, with your your history of active work, so I like I, I like the uh, thing that's uh, uh, Dr. Pym mentions a lot as well. So actionable science, so science that you can get out. And I see that not only in your biography picture, but in your work and how you're, you know, uh, it, it, it talks about how you went out, were watching birds and looking at the eggs. And, and so you're out in the field a lot. You're trying to apply the actions as well. Um, how have all that background, all that study and research prepared you during this time of pandemic. So you, you deal with pandemics, you research that, you write about that, SARS, MERS, HIV, uh, on and on. Um, has that helped you at all to weather this pandemic time and how has it been for you? Well, I, I think most, many people who are scientists, there's a long period of gestation. You, you know, you start out as a little kid who's interested in natural history, and then you do all the business of uh, getting into university and studying it in depth there. And then if you're lucky, as I've been lucky all along, you get to work with people who mentor you in, in different areas. So very early on, uh, Roy Anderson, who you, who you mentioned, started mentoring me in what was then a very early area, the, the, the mathematics of infectious diseases, and, and why had ecologists not really thought about infectious diseases as important for natural systems? They just thought them as, of them as random events that appear and cause catastrophes, and then they disappear. Uh, and Roy, and, and very much also Bob May, uh, who worked together to build this monumental body of theory that let us understand that when we look at diseases, we need to use a mathematical framework and that they are central to the lives of all living organisms. And in, from an ecological sense, certainly as important, if not more important than predation and competition, which were the things that had fascinated ecologists right back through Darwin to the earliest people who thought about natural history. And I guess the, the key thing there is, you know, you only, if you're a zebra, you only get eaten once by a lion. 
sometimes the presence of the lion will affect where you feed. So it's the thought of being eaten is with you all the time. But if you're a nematode, a parasitic nematode or a virus, you're living in that species all the time and taking a daily incremental reduction in its energy budget and causing its immune system to work in a different way. So most living creatures are dealing with parasites and pathogens the whole time. So to me, it was like, wow, ecologists haven't thought about this way before. So kid in a candy store, there were all sorts of fun projects that can be worked on to show how important a role pathogens play. And then ultimately, how diverse pathogens are across the whole um, biosphere. You know, every living species has about 10 to 20 parasitic and species that live in it or on it. So, so instantly you've got 10 to 20 times as much biodiversity as we thought we have, but it's all eating things from the inside out rather than the outside in as a one-off event. So the curious thing is, is that that original ecological perspective that these things just appear as a disaster once in a while is very good planning for mentally planning for thinking of things like COVID or HIV or, or SARS because it doesn't suggest they're one-off things it suggests there's a ton of them out there and what are the circumstances that cause them to move from one host species into a new host species and we, we mainly study humans and the domestic livestock from that perspective and why what's the difference between the ones that do make that jump and take off spectacularly and the ones that make that jump and just never take off at all so it was like we need to have uh, a body of theory that lets you look at that and then as i say going back to the scientific thing you you spend your whole life as a scientist as a nerd sort of building up this volume of knowledge and, and then increasingly you see what's happening to the world you think we have to do something about this because we're massively dependent on that world much more than it's dependent upon us and it's got some nasty surprises in that if we mismanage it could cause huge problems for humans i had another professor from oxford on the podcast his name is tomas david barrett and he uh speaks at uh, i think is jesus college is wh yeah. where he is specifically and he has a he just launched a new program in a book that he's writing it's called human beasts right. and um w when we had a discussion we talked about you know how he weathered the pandemic and he said you know i just i had a discussion with a a, a zoo designer so it's a world famous guy who designed zoos for different species and animals and he uh, said but we're, we're living in this human zoo. I can see you've got a fairly nice human zoo. You've traveled the world. You, you've probably seen numerous human zoos. But during this lockdown, this pandemic, it's given at each one of us a, a, a real close, in-depth look at our human zoos and what we've created for ourselves for, you know, whether it's 24-7 lockdown we're here or if we don't have nature close by. And, you know, you can, you can hear all the you know the whether it's domestic abuse goes up or fighting or strife or whether it's just fabulous you know first time you're learning how to cook again or you know whatever emerges um the the question that i asked you was really do you have any tools tips or tricks that maybe helped you weather this pandemic better because you've you you actually consult or you actually write about what can people do? What's the science behind it? What, what can they do to avoid or, or what actionable things can they do when things come like this before? And I, I know you probably maybe didn't need to apply any of those immediately, but th that gives you in some respects in my vision, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, a little form of resilience, uh, like uh, you're almost like a futurist. So you know how to study, you can maybe kind of predict where the math models and the science is going and and uh does that give you some resilience in your own life just having that knowledge seeing the world in a different light that has maybe helped you even weather this time better yeah, i don't know it's i i think everybody's wrestled with the earth with this time I, I i think i am unbelievably lucky in that you know uh, both my kids uh, have graduated from college and, and, and are not living at home, so we don't have to worry about children going out. 
Uh, if we'd been locked down with kids, I think we'd have been having, I can't imagine how tough that must be for people who are having to do that and do the whole homeschooling thing. As it is, we're going to be teaching for the university online and that's going to be a whole sort of new experience. Um, the other sort of thing of being a scientist, you've always got all this stuff that you kept meaning to finish off and you never had the time for. So suddenly having everything shut down, it's like, oh, there's this backlog of stuff I can now get through. So it's been great for me that, the, you know, contracts on books, which I thought I had to keep delaying. It's like, oh, we can speed up and get stuff like this done now. So, so you, you, as a nerd, you always have this ability to go back into yourself. Uh, and then I am, it's been delightful for me to uh, be in the same place. And, and, and as a biologist, I'm constantly going to different places uh, to look for things and find things. But it was nice to stay in the same place and just watch the whole spring and summer emerge and change and really concentrate on the sort of small things like the, the hummingbirds that come and feed on the, the flowers outside my window, uh, the foxes that have got a den at the bottom of the yard, uh, and then going, the, the thing that's kept us most sane, I think, is a dog, just having a, we got a young puppy to go with our older dog in the fall, and, and just taking the dog out for a walk to uh, different locations every morning. It's been spectacularly nice. As you see those different areas developing, and, and there's this, uh, I, I live in New Jersey, which everybody in the United Kingdom thinks of uh, as sort of being like Essex, it's endless uh, oil refineries. But, but in fact, I, I've had a student who's just finished a PhD that's shown that actually 35% of New Jersey is given over as nature reserves, which is uh, similar to Tanzania and Costa Rica. And there's just wonderful places to go and wander around and do natural history. So it's, it's being a biologist that always keeps me sane on, on one side. And then the, the other thing that always got me, uh, for a block at a time, my, my father had a, a, a pub in Essex. Like I'm allowed to be a little bit rude about Essex because I live there. Uh, but we had quite a healthy population of uh, significant criminals who come in. And whenever they got sent down, they would always come in and they say, yeah, I'm, done, I'm back on my yoga routine. I'm back thinking about yoga. I'm doing the Zen thing. I'm just getting mentally prepared to be in lockdown for a couple of months, or a couple of years in those cases. And, and, and this whole concept of, yeah, you can actually, it's every morning in the basement. I'll do my half an hour yoga and position myself to think through the day that way. That's beautiful. Yeah, so learn you. from the best in some ways. <laughs> yeah. well, th well, thank you for sharing that for me. And it also gives me, gives a, a nice insight that you're not some, some uh, alien from another planet of scientists that's been dropped here to disseminate another report that you, um, uh, to us that, that there is, uh, you know, that natural thing. The, that kind of le leads in as well to this, um, to the paper and some of the things you, you, you've written, um, um, there, there was this comment that you made in, in one of your papers that, that I want to dissect a little bit. Um, and, it, and it basically goes like, the epidemic of submitted papers has like went up <laughs> exponentially. And, and it, 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 over the years, it, whether it's climate change or or, or other things, these papers are vast and numerous and becoming more and more. I find it difficult uh, if, if us as human beings are confronted with a bear, a lion, a tiger, we like freeze or run or we panic. We have this fight or flight instinct in us. But then when we're bombarded with this pile or mountain of, you know, 100 page papers th that are telling us about, you know, climate science or uh, pandemics or, or uh, biological issues, we're like, oh, another graph, another paper. We don't even read it or, or we don't know how to understand and dissect it. In your, in your paper, uh, the one that I mentioned is, is much uh, different than that. It's uh, one, it's open. It's been published on, on The Guardian. Uh, so you don't need to have a, have a nature or scientific login to access the paper and that work. But it's a, a, a lot about preventative measures or things that we could do to put in place and the costs and, and what we could do and what the long-term costs are, the short-term costs, the, the preventative pre-costs that we have and how that uh, 
uh, is compared to a reactionary. If we just wait and do nothing and then a hat comes, what the re how, how much more the reactionary costs are. And so I, 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 really, I really like that in, in your papers. How can you give us some advice on not only dissect the paper a little bit more and, and kind of tell us your, your thoughts, but how do we get into this dilemma where we are, this information overload of scientific paperwork and, and we're really just ready for streaming Netflix and, and you know, we're, we're disseminating totally other information for the layperson. How, how, can, how can we use that or are these papers not even meant for us and, and are they reaching the right people to take actions on them? Yeah, I mean, that's a very complex question. It is. Just take it from the top. I, 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 I think we should say straight up that the, 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 the paper we wrote was actually in science. And then we got lots of interviews, particularly a wonderful chat with the guy from The Guardian. And he did a fantabulous job of synthesizing what we say and then putting it in The Guardian. And, and in fact, one of the things that Stuart and I and, and other people do is, is to go out of your way as a scientist to both write the scientific paper, which has got to be in the language of science, and it then gets peer reviewed by fellow scientists to appear uh, in the scientific literature. And as I said, this is where we're getting at this pandemic of that. But it's similar, we, we put as much effort into writing the press release and contacting journalists so as what the what the implications of the science can then be discussed in the in the literature much more broadly and in a way that's access, accessible to a much broader audience. And, and I think that's as important an exercise as writing this sort of scientific paper, particularly if it's a scientific paper that has important implications for public policy. So, so, so that was very much a sort of conscious decision to expand out and do that outreach part of it. Um, how on earth did, I mean, when I was a graduate student uh, and a postdoc, I would spend most weekend in the library just reading everything new that would come out and, and trying to keep up with everything everybody was doing. And that back in the 80s when I was doing it was probably the last time you could do that because there's just too much coming out now. And, and certainly this time last year, we had no idea what COVID was. There are now over 10,000 papers on it in six months, which is usually it takes you six months to write a paper, put it in for review and have it come out if it's on a fast track. So, so to have 10,000 papers on this thing is indigestible. Now, partly for me, things like Twitter have been useful because people will pick up on different things and then there'll be a discussion. And then you go, you know, there's enough discussion about what's in this that I might go and read that paper rather than try and find it de novo for myself. You know, you hope the sort of cream of the crop arrives in the top scientific journals. So when you get your weekly edition of Science and Nature or PLOS Biology online, you can go and look for that straight off and sort of find what, what, what's there for that. But some of it, uh, it, it, it's a myth that all the most innovative and creative things make it into the top journals. Quite a lot of it that's in there is innovative and creative or has very charismatic authors but you might miss something really good because the people refereeing it didn't see its implications and it slipped off somewhere else. So you've got to have people keeping an eye out for that. And there's enough of a community of scientists whose opinions you trust on Twitter to think, hey, someone's picked up on this. This is really interesting. And they plenty have difficulty getting it out, but this is actually important. And again, I guess it's something you said we like to talk about later. I actually think that scientists are amongst the most international community of people. Because you go, I go to the, whenever I'm allowed back in again, into my, the department on campus, it's a very international place. We've got people there from all over the world. We all go to meetings in different places and see each other and spend time working with scientists in different countries. So, so, so I think particularly in, in the sort of conservation area and in the healthcare area, scientists is completely international community of people who are working incredibly synergistically with each other, much more so than, than, than this impression that we're all competing with each other. I think COVID has shown that there's a huge amount of synergy and people are having to listen to each other and, and say, no, this is too big for any one of us. Different people are gonna have to focus in on different things. And, and that's actually spectacularly different from 
earlier epidemics, such as HIV, that, that when HIV appeared, um, there was this sort of ugly pissing match between people who wanted to be the first person to discover what it was, because that's where the Nobel Prize was. There, there doesn't seem to be as much of that with, with, with COVID as there was with HIV. I, I had the uh, director of um, uh, innovation and development, uh, research and development from MIT Media Labs on, on and um, he, we talked briefly about what you just talk, touched upon. Um, as well, where this transition to now, um, we're, we're going to partly go back, but we're also going to create this big, uh, you know, type or, or a, a different way of doing things online, to reaching out to the students online. In science uh, and, and lab work or anything like that, this is pretty hard to do um, to a certain, certain degree. And it's surprising how many universities I've seen out there that, um, we're not all ready, prepared in some respects on that transition, but also the the integration of how now does the professor who's at home um, and then the students, how, do, how does that still come across? How does that function with different computer types and technologies? And um, that that does also lead into the question that, that you uh, mentioned uh, that I have for you. It's Basically, do you consider yourself a global citizen? And how would you feel about a future without nations, borders, limitations, separation of humanity? Um, because I mean, that, that also really ties into not only this transition that universities are making um, to online. I, I've been involved in it from the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network that's done online MOOC courses for years now with the Jeffrey, Professor Jeffrey Sachs in Columbia. And, uh, and they have great universities. Berkeley and Princeton are part of those as well. They have online MOOC courses. But that is not a, for me, it's also not a unified transition for the entire university. It's small pockets. And so I'd like to see your insight on that, but also what's the future of your work going to look like um, in, that, so in that question? It's kind of complex, multifaceted. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I, I agree that there, there, there are obviously multiple answers. Uh, deep down, I, 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 I think Dr. Johnson said it first and said it best that, that patriotism is the last resort of a bounder. Uh, and, and these sort of nationalist movements we're seeing at the moment are plainly completely useless at dealing with something like COVID. You, you, you can't pretend to have a nationalist organization that's going to be used like that. So, and as I mentioned earlier, science is a massively international uh, enterprise. And, and, and part of the delights of being a scientist is to be able to collaborate internationally with people. Um, for the last, I, I guess I started with one of my very first job, the first semester when I was at Rochester in 1987. I, I got asked, because someone else was sick, uh, Roy Anderson was ill and couldn't make the meeting, so I got asked to go and teach at the uh, International Center for Theoretical Physics, which is in Trieste in, in uh, Italy. Uh, the International Center was set up by uh, Salim Ali, who was the first non-Western person to win a Nobel Prize. He won a Nobel Prize for field theory and physics and decided he would take that money to set up an international center for people such as himself, who come from a tiny village in Pakistan, but were scientists who wanted to work on big, hard problems. So, so they set up ICTP to do that, to bring in people from the, the, the southern nations all over the world to learn physics, chemistry uh, initially. And, and then um, some of my colleagues said, well, it would be quite useful for these people. Ecology and epidemiology have now got this deep mathematical background that's uh, similar to the things that physicists do. So it would be good to teach these things because they might also be useful for them when they go back home. So, so, so since 1986, we've been bringing people there every couple of years to specifically talk about or to learn about uh, the mathematics that lies behind environmental management, the mathematics that lies behind uh, epidemics and, uh, and disease control. And that's created a mass international network of 
young, and they were young when they started, they're all quite mature now, uh, scientists with their own younger scientists who all work together on these problems. And it was incredibly useful for things like when HIV came along about, uh, it, it meant we could, they had a bunch of people who understood what the dynamics of that were likely to be back in Uganda and East Africa or what it was going to be like in South America and knew how to respond in similar ways and talk to each other about what different countries were doing. So that was also pretty healthy that the different continents would then set up meetings within each continent to each other. And, so, and that was nice because, you know, the, the Spanish would all be speaking Spanish with each other. That makes it go a bit faster. Africa doesn't have a common language, so they would go at a different rate. Um, but I think you don't need to have a completely lose all national barriers because particularly for many indigenous peoples, that, that is a thing that massively enriches the world and enriches our understanding uh, uh, of the world. So I'd hate to see us lose the Inuit or the Maasai or, or the, the Hadza. So, so you have to retain some aspect of uh, identity with the region in which you, your peoples have lived for a long time. But that doesn't have to be this egregiously and ab abhorrent nationalism. It's often, you know, for, for, for white people to have a nationalist like pride in the US when they've only been here for three generations is appalling. The, 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 uh, the, it, it, it's, it's, so it, it's massively misplaced and it's replacing a lot of other insecurities that those people have. You, you obviously are uh, living in, um, you, uh, you, you do see yourself as a global citizen. Uh, um, and well, I, I spend time in lots of different countries. Yeah, where, yeah, and yeah, yeah. I'm, you know, I am, I, I, I'm, I'm, I grew up in Scotland, but, but yeah. I, you know, I, I feel very much at home when I'm in Scotland, but growing up in Scotland as a kid with an English accent, I was very much strongly let know back in the 60s that I was yeah. not local. Yeah, yeah. So that um, 1.5 Media Innovators Magazine is in Glasgow. That's the headquarters there. And so, yeah, that, that's really interesting. I want to move a little bit more towards um, uh, the food aspect now, if that's okay. Um, I call myself a global food reformist and coming out with a new book uh, called Menu B, People and Planet, Food Saving Solutions. And it's more on the lines of Paul Hawkins' book, The Drawdown, right. and, and the Drawdown Review. What I'm trying to do is, is uh, find... Um, the, the latest innovations, tools, tricks, tips um, to do in the, in the food system, the complex food web uh, 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 system that we have to, to draw down our human health problems, our environmental problems, because uh, in, in my opinion, they're, they're um, much stronger than that of the oil, coal, and gas industry, the chemical industry, or the the automotive industry. They're still on the list, don't get me wrong, but I think that food is something that we all do each and every single day. We're tied to, it's a basic resource of keeping our, regulating our temperature, but that we really need to globally reform food that in the, whether, whether you look at the industrial revolution or if you look at We've been doing uh, agrarian societies for 10,000, 12,000 years. There's really only been about six great innovations in, in that time period. So we're still kind of stuck in the dark ages or industrial age on how we produce and, and that it's only getting worse. We're wasting more food, we're wasting more resources. And uh, August 22nd was Earth Overshoot Day. and so. Um, your ties to food and your vision on how you see it, what are the tools, the tips, the tricks, and how do you see food affecting not only human health, but also drawing down our environmental problems? And what are your feelings on that? Well, I mean, plainly, everybody has to have access to food as a human right. Uh, and we have this problem that we've got to feed everybody and we've got to feed everybody with healthy food. And 
that again there's this how do you define healthy because one of the other problems is to grow enough food we need land and we either get land by converting tropical forests or tropical savannas uh, into fields for soy and, and, and cattle or we find more efficient ways of using the land we have to produce a higher volume of high quality food and that's you know the central dilemma that faces conservation biology and is frustrating in many ways because the conservation of biodiversity move, movement is massively um, tied to the anti-genetically modified food movement. And I think that's a big mistake. We only have any biodiversity left in Southeast Asia and in much of Africa because of the Green Revolution, being able to, to massively increase the productivity of areas that had already been uh, converted for, for, for rice in, in particular, having genetically modified rice and breeding rice to be more productive hugely increased the production of the land we already had and stopped the destruction of the remaining land in Southeast Asia. If we hadn't had the Green Revolution, we would have no forest left in Southeast Asia and you'd still need about a quarter of Africa to feed the uh, the, the turn of the century population of Southeast Asia. So we, we have to see that increasing the efficacy of food production is central to anything we want to do with biological diversity, because still the biggest threat to biodiversity is loss of land, conversion of land through burning rainforests, converting savannas, and producing relatively low quality food on that land, because there, there is this sort of deep irony that it's not the most productive soils that give you tropical forests. The reason those forests are so diverse is the relatively low quality soil means you have lots of species competing with each other rather than one super competitor going for the best quality soil. So, so people tend to look at tropical forests and say, if it's abundant as this, it must be great for agriculture. That's always been pure crap. It's like if it's not very diverse and there's good soil, that might be good for converting for agriculture. But we, we've converted most of the really good land. What we need to do is think about restoring land that used to be productive for agriculture but has lost its productivity and is now being misused or just abandoned. And, and, and as I say, looking at viable genetic modifications of crops to make them more productive without necessarily doing the very dodgy things to create a monopoly that the, the big ag people try and do. They've got to see that feeding the planet should be the motivation to feed lots of people rather than just the pockets of the deeply wealthy people who are part of a big ag, which is you know, in its way almost as corrupt as big pharma. There, there's a lot of uh, deb debate and controversy around GMO um, uh, that, that many have taken up and um, not fully understood the the not only the science but all, just what's what's really the truth behind it what's really the reality behind it so in, in uh, an agrarian society in agriculture really for um since the beginning we've been doing grafting and splicing and different types of modifications that are not in, in a laboratory but are still in a science you know farming is a, a form of a science in in, in some respect you didn't believe in gmos you'd never yeah, eat a yeah, straw yeah, you'd it's never eat a straw. unnatural hybrid between a north american species and a european exactly species and victorians Exactly. genetically modified over a century ago yeah yeah tons of modifications over a century and grafting splicing and many other techniques that uh, actually occur at the farm area not in some lab a lot a lot of people have this view of gmo as something occurring in a lab and i also believe that uh, it's one tool for the for a, a multifaceted yeah. complex yeah. system toolbox that uh, can, can really help us, but it's a much more complex thing that, that needs to be to be addressed. Um, in, in my, I think, yeah. I mean, one, going back to your earlier question, how have I coped with COVID? I, the, the wonderful thing about New Jersey is that New Jersey was the sort of uh, 
the, the food basket for New York and much of the uh, uh, eastern seaboard for, for much of the last century, but it's still got fantastic farms. So, so, so I, I usually go to the farmer's market on Saturday, but with COVID, I've only been buying food from the farmer's market. And that's been great because everything is now bought locally. I don't go to the local supermarket to get stuff wrapped in plastic that's come a huge distance anymore. And that our sort of standard and quality of eating is two to five times what it was pre-COVID because everything's local and fresh. And you know, you get to go and actually talk about it. As I was in the store this morning, the, the wife of the farmer was in there chatting to people and there's you know, people from all over the world being employed there. And it's a completely different social experience going out to get food there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really nice. If you've uh, seen any of the images or the media of grocery stores um, uh, during the pandemic, you know, they all show, you know, all the toilet paper gone, all, you know, right. all, all the, the preserved the canned goods gone. Um, but in a few of them, if you look closely, uh, as they walk by the fresh produce area, they're always pretty full. And that's really what people, you know, should, should, should go to and learn, you know, techniques of the pr preserving and jamming and, and dehydrating and fermenting and, and things so that, you know, if it can't be eaten fresh immediately and it's not going to make it uh, long enough in your fridge, that then, you, you know, you, you make a juice, you make a soup, you make something that can be preserved for a long time. You put it in your cold storage. Uh, um, something that, you know, so there's such a complex, big thing, but also some really wonderful things that have emerged during that time. And so it's, it's great to hear that. And one of your other papers, you um, mentioned something that ties to the GMOs. And so I want to address that now. So it's this, this resistance, drug resistance, pesticide and insecticide um, resistance. And I am um, absolutely uh, I, I think GMOs are fine and they, they serve a, fa a facet in the toolbox, but when it's complementary or needs to be used with a chemical or fertilizer or a pesticide or insecticide to make it work, then that's where I, I uh, drastically change and, and move away. And so you, you mentioned that, you know, in, in, um, how, how this drug resistance pesticides and insecticides are actually uh, tying into the evolution of not only viruses and pandemics and how they're, you know, those are things, some lot, there's, there's two other terms that you use. So let me just look here. It's um, basically the incubation infection periods and, and how quickly they emerge and how they evolve over time. And and so I don't know if you could maybe address that as well, or your thoughts and feelings. No, I mean, part of that goes back to some work I, I, I did with Bob May when I was first here at Princeton as, as a postdoc in, in the 80s. Uh, the, the National Academy was putting together a report on insecticide resistance and had asked Bob to give a talk. And he said to me, can you, could we do something together on this? And, uh, and so we said, it would be interesting to look at the, the rate at which resistance to insecticides evolves in different species. Uh, and so I went, you know, went to the library, dug out a bunch of things, and then, you know, it, it's really blatantly obviously, but I put it together on the table, I said, it's like, you know, insecticide resistance never evolved in the birds of prey that were exposed to DDT. Whereas the insects or the mosquitoes or the, the bacteria, uh, it evolves really quickly in that. And then Bob said, well, you know, if you write down an equation for evolution, the, the, to a rough approximation, the, the, the time at which resistance evolves is one over the log of generation time. So the shorter the generation time, the faster resistance evolves. So it's not surprising that uh, viruses can evolve resistance really, really quickly. Insects can do it quite quickly, but the birds of prey just never have enough generations, so their eggs are always going to be crushed. And, and, and that goes to that sort of huge asymmetry that's aired there with these GMO crops that are designed to be resistant to things. So as when you spray them with that, you kill all the weeds around them. And Bob wrote something that that's not widely quoted, but he said, um, it, it shows the appalling arrogance 
uh, of the uh, agricultural industry that it assumes that the food and the land it's grown on should only be for the use of humans. We have to recognize that other species use that land and may actually be doing the job of protecting us from the pests of agriculture that we will ever be able to do. And so I, I, that very much I took those sort of thoughts to heart. They, 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 this whole idea that, that, that agriculture is this desert that's just producing food and nothing else should be alive, alive in there is complete antithesis to what New Jersey looks like. The moment when you walk around these fields, there are hedgerows, there's foxes wandering in and out of them. It's still producing spectacularly good food, uh, but it's not the sort of industrialized muck that most people would be better off converting into ethanol than actually eating themselves. Yeah, exactly. There's, um, so I come from six generations of organic farmers and oh, ter Germany's, Germany's largest organic farmers and four generations of hydroponics, so these uh, aeroponic farmers, um, and de dealt with food and, uh, uh, and this a long time. In the last 10 uh, or so years, there's been a lot of movements, especially in the uh, FAO and awareness around farming for regenerative agriculture, agroecology, uh, and permaculture and no-till, so a lot to yep. do with uh, um, getting away from monocrops and diversification of di uh, uh, crops with permaculture and regenerative ag works, mixing different crops and using this uh, some of these no-till methods, uh, using an IO IMO type of um, Fertilizer, which is uh, is, is uh, organic, it's called in, IMO stands for indigenous microorganisms. Yeah. So, for the local place where you're at, you actually create your own indigenous microorganism. What's specific to the type of crops in the area you live in, the soil, the the waters, and and, and that and the kind of it's almost like a. a, a different fermentation type of process the way you create that how how that is created locally and just some amazing things uh, are, are being seen and done in in that respect and so i i have seen fabulous results in, in a lot of these local farmer markets whether it's new jersey and or whether it's in in germany or whether it's in and uh, you know, real remote places of the world that those who have applied that are actually finding that, uh, especially in developing countries, is turning into a form of a food forest. And it's really, it's just it's a thriving, better model that um, uh, really solves a, a big problem around our soils. And uh, that, that is a huge problem, not only with uh, pesticides and chemicals, but what, what is occurring is the FAO said five years ago, said we have 50 harvests left until our soils are ruined. So now we're four, and five years later, 45 uh, harvests left. But that's on tradi traditional monoculture, uh, a big industrial agriculture, uh, where they use pesticides, chemicals, and, and those type of fertilizers that to in their process. And so if we switch, if we change that system and we come up with other ways where we do these on a large scale, which is possible, or on a very local scale to the small, medium uh, uh, size farms and, 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 and agriculture, I, I believe it is truly a better model, not only for the encroachment on tropical uh, uh, diversity and forests and, and that, that we're encroaching on those because of animal agriculture, but also on just, you know, planting soy and palm oil or whatever the, the different crop is at the time, which is uh, what comes from the Stockholm Resilience Institute, uh, living within the safe operating spaces of our planetary yeah. boundaries, within the resources we have for that year, and we're already kind of encroaching on, on some, some outside. So, I don't, I don't know if you have any, any more to, to say about that, but that... Uh... I, mean, I, I think it's a crucial message of this bizarre misconception that like the most important resources on the planet are oil and gold. And, and, and exploration for oil and gold are two of the most damaging things we're doing to the planet. And those are two not very useful resources, increasingly less and less useful resources. Whereas, as you say, 
the things that we've got a limited time for that are central to our existence are soils and water. Yeah, we're, we're heading as rapidly towards a water crisis as we are towards a soil crisis. Uh, humans cannot survive without a liter of two liters of water a day. And, and everybody on the planet needs two liters of water a day. And the only place we realistically get that in a clean, controlled fashion is from the world's forests. As we diminish the world's forests, the water is not stored anywhere and released and cleaned at a slow rate. It just runs off and takes the soil with it into the ocean. So until we have changed the way we think about climate and land management to consider that the two crucial resources that we're much more dependent on than oil and gold are soil and water, you know, we're in a mess. Yeah, and uh, we're... we're, we're... I see a lot of change and, and uh, there are a lot of big organizations that are on the move towards a global food reform. Um, the, the way it ties into the question I asked you about global citizenry is because during the pandemic, food was the only thing that really wasn't locked down uh, as well as th those birds and species that can cross cross borders. Um, but uh, humans were the ones who were domesticated and in the lockdown and kind of confined to certain certain areas um, and and how do we think on a different global operating system or model of, of doing things um, while still preserving these nationalistic these borders is there a way that we could raise the bar higher and say, this is a global standard we're not going to let humanity ever get below, but we still have our cultures and our nations, but uh, the standard is set much higher on, on a global level. Um, whether that can be addressed or, 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 or solved at uh, this time, obviously not, but it leads into my question, uh, the first big burning question, WTF, that I'm asking you is what's the future? Well, the, 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 the mathematicians always joke, the thing about the future is we should never predict what's going to happen. <laughs> uh, but I, I would like to think that we use COVID uh, as an experience that tells us we need to be more international. The, 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 the people who have done a good job of dealing with COVID are the same people who did a really good job of dealing with Ebola and HIV. And that's organizations like the WHO, the World Health Organization. And also the United Nations needs to have stronger powers that it can only achieve by each nation having more sympathy by the, with the polyglot way that the United Nations actually has to operate because it has to represent all, all, all people. But you need that organization to be something that sets an example that offsets itself against this self-serving nationalism that doesn't serve anybody other than the individuals in charge of it. So you need that much more uh, um, open-minded international mindset to be able to deal with things like environmental crises and the next pandemic. Because looking into the future, this isn't the last time this isn't going to happen. Uh, I, I mean, in that science paper, if you look at the frequency with which these things arrive, we, we get two new viruses in humans every year that we haven't seen before and roughly at the same frequency as we have presidential elections in the US or parliamentary elections in Britain, you get one that establishes and starts causing a pandemic. So, you know, three or four years time, something else is gonna come along. And thanks to COVID, we're in a much worse economic state to be able to deal with it. Hopefully we've got much deeper scientific understanding of how to deal with these things. But the better way to go is to set new systems in place that stop them coming over at the rate at which they're coming over at the present time. And those things are the things we mentioned in the paper, hugely reduce the rate at which we're chopping down tropical forests because lots of things are coming through that way. 
do something about the wildlife trade because that's entirely focused on producing luxury goods for this, not producing food for poor people. It's producing luxury stuff for the fur industry, for the strange sort of drug industry. It could easily be stopped and it's intrinsically intertwined with, with the human trafficking and arms trafficking. So it's a major criminal enterprise that we need to just get a grip on and close down. And the other thing that people that we're getting emerging disease from is intensive agriculture. And again, rethinking that agricultural model. So is it's not so much producing new pathogens as creating the, 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 the resistance that, that, that we see in many of the sort of E. coli and bacteria things that emerge from intensive agriculture. So there's a, quite a few things there that you mentioned that I'd like to kind of unpack. Uh, the first one's more just a, 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 a mean comment. Uh, I hope that they get the vaccination for the Trumpocalypse distributed before <laughs> November so that the, the vote goes correct. Um, there's, there's, no hope. <laughs> <laughs> but, there's, no, uh, there's no hope of them having a, a vaccine to the scale they need by November. Uh, you know, even, and I suspect the people in Oxford are ahead of everybody else on, on, on this one. And they've already started sort of production of what they've got. Um, but, you know, global production of vaccines for the vaccines we already have is pretty much at the max. If we have a whole new pathogen that we've got to vaccinate everybody on the planet with, then we've got a double vaccine making. Uh, and, and that's going to take two or three years to be able to do that, even if we have a successful vaccine. The, the other thing is, we don't know how long immunity lasts. Uh, we don't, I mean, the, the reports earlier this week that people in, uh, I think it was Korea or somewhere in Southeast Asia, were getting second doses of COVID, not showing any symptoms, but we don't know if they were, were, were transmitting it or not. That, that suggests that if natural immunity is only six months to a year, then once we have a vaccine, everybody has got to be vaccinated every six months to a year. Yeah. And, you know, it's hard enough to get older people to be vaccinated for influenza every year. And we have all this sort of vaccine rejection by the, the, the religious loonies in other places. So that's going to be a non-trivial enterprise. Yeah, it really is. I mean, it's not only uh, can be seen in other areas. I mean, when, when you get a new iPhone or a new Galaxy phone or a new computer, I mean, we, we can't even keep up to date with all the updates that they do right. every year for security and viruses or for new operating systems, let alone read where, what button to push or how to update us on that speed, because it's just it's, it, it's, it's too much and, and, and have a vaccine, even if we're going to get a vaccine every six months or, you know, it's, that's not the future we want to be in for, for absolute, for sure. In the paper. But, but you, also, yeah. you also want a treatment. I, I mean, we, we've yeah. been very lucky that the death mexosome, uh, it, it seems to be a, a cheap, already available thing that, that, that does a fantastic job of reducing inflammation in people with severe COVID. And then that seems to be the major pathology that we've been able to knock down. But we need other forms of treatment that, 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 that could be much more widely used at an earlier stage of infection. Because it's a simple question. Would you take a test vaccine if you didn't know there was a cure for it if the vaccine doesn't work? No, I would. They give you the vaccine and then they're going to expose you to, to COVID. Would you do that if there was no treatment for you if the vaccine doesn't work? So you, yeah, you need yeah. the treatment almost more than you need the vaccine. Yeah, I agree. The, in your paper, you talk about um, a lot of preventative uh, and uh, tropical deforestation. So again, to me, and maybe it's just the weird way I think, it has to do with globalization because uh, we're talking about uh, different areas where there's uh, loss of biodiversity and tropical forest, but that leaders in the United States, leaders in the European Union, leaders in, uh, uh, the, you know, that are probably not doing that good uh, leading in the, in the fast few years, the Bolsonaros, the Trumps, the Putins, the uh, the Wartes, the Erdogans, that 
that actually the whole world is now relying upon them to not only put the monies in, but to pr protect and uh, conserve those those tropical forests to prevent deforestation, to also put plans and measures into place um, that really affect us all in the transmission and the prevention or the ease of future, it's gonna come regardless, but the ease so that it's not a, a, a re reactionary measure that we take that we're a little bit better prevail or uh, prepared and have a little bit more resilience. Um, and for me, that, that's the, our current civilization operating models that we function on, um, whether it's the UN or just individual nations, United States uh, or the European Union or China uh, are not unified in their prevention methods or how they address this say, yeah, no, who, who's gonna foot the bill Who's gonna read the science? Who's gonna say, no, that's exactly what we need to do, but on a global level, because they're making decisions for us on a global level. Uh, do, am I seeing it wrong or am I understanding it right, you know? Well, I, I, I think scientists and policymakers have to be clearer about the consequences of deforestation and the consequences of another epidemic. But similarly, scientists have to think more like businessmen and say, can we come up with solutions for this that people can invest in so as the solution stops the bad thing happening, but does so in a way that generates job and income for people who are prepared to invest in it. And that requires more interactions between Ecologists who are thinking, you know, which, which won't be lumped in with a, a, a environmentalists and economists, uh, and perhaps also with sort of business people and entrepreneurs to sort of say, how can we develop economic models that are going to create huge incentives for doing sensible things rather than corrupting incentives for doing bad things? You know, it, it, it's one of the books I've been reading in, in lockdown is it, it, it uh, this wonderful book about the um, the end of democracy, uh, which says no, well, probably not. Yeah, by Neil, uh, and I'm going to get the guy's name wrong. He's a Cambridge. It, it'll come to me in a second. Um, but, but he points out that, that democracy is not designed to make sensible, or to, to 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 make creative new solutions. You, you rely on industry and technology to come with new solutions. What democracy is designed to do is to have a range of differing opinions so really stupid bad things don't happen. You've always got somebody to vote in some ways against innovation and control the rate at which it's happening. Uh, and it's just that that is corrupted by a handful of people making huge amounts of profits out of tropical deforestation, oil, exploration, gold mining, being able to pay for the political campaigns of people who come in and instead of respecting democracy, abuse it for their own self-interest. One of your papers, you mentioned Bartlett and, and uh, I don't know if you mean, mean uh, Bartlett or Bartlett's yeah, Beaker. Runson is the guy who's written Democracy Book, I should say. Okay, okay. Runson, yes. Runson. Runson, R-U-N-C-I-N-A. Okay. Uh, and, and one of your papers, you mentioned um, Bartlett, and I don't know if it's a Bartlett of Bartlett speakers and the exponential function. Is that the same Bartlett or is it a different Bartlett? The, the guy who invented uh, stochastic calculus and did yeah. lots of original work on the, the population dynamics of measles, uh, which is still the disease that gives us the most important insights to how viral diseases work in population. And so the the reason I bring it up because he uh, you know is, uh, did a, a fabulous things, but also is very big proponent as the one of the biggest problems or uh, human failures we have is not uh, rightly grasping or understanding the exponential function with viruses and pandemics and things. Um, you all too well know how that exponential function works and how quickly things can spread. Um, 
which is in stark contrast almost to what you just said about democracy and how we need to let um, people who, who don't have a clue slow the process down because that exponential function isn't going to slow down because people who don't have a clue are saying, oh no, let's, let's take it slow. So uh, I, I, how do we keep up to speed with our exponentially growing world, good, bad, and ugly, the viruses, the pandemics, but also use it in a positive way, use the exponential function in a positive way to get back into the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries, heal our health and our viruses, and more so, um, the, the, the next question that I'm trying to ask you with this is, I believe a lot of this is these issues are tied to the healthy biome of our earth. The more deforestation, the more encroachment, the more um, things, the uh, more unhealthy that biome is, which really affects us. And it, it's one of exponential. So how can we use that function in a positive way to, to also in preventative measures like your paper speaks about? I, you know, I don't know if, if you're following me, but it's uh, to me, it's almost like we've We've, we've got this world that's growing exponentially around us, good, bad, and ugly, but we're still kind of stuck in the industrial age. We're still stuck in these very bureaucratic or uh, every four years we vote in a new guy who doesn't know anything about helping us get to where we really need to be on some of the, these decisions or, or prevention. Yeah, no, I am. Uh... I, I, again, that's partly, you know, exponential functions is, is one of the, the reasons that nerds love science, because they, you know, particularly things like um, the structure of forests, ecosystems, savannas, it is interactions between species each of which had the potential to grow exponentially, but because of the way they interact, eating each other from the inside or the outside, depending whether you're a parasite or a predator, slows down that exponential growth rate, but creates a growth rate in another species that's capitalizing on those meals. So, so trying to understand the mathematics of how all those things interact with each other, I, I think is the major scientific challenge of this century. You know, we're, we're, we're moving beyond the, the age of physics and chemistry, which deal with one or two particles bumping into each other and, and really doing anything exponential. Uh, um, they're done at a spectacularly heroic scale, either the very tiny scale of quarks and bosons or the scale of planets and the Big Bang, but they're bugger all use to people alive on this planet at the moment. They're great for the egos of the physicists yeah. working on them, but they have very little use for humans. Whereas the structure of everything in the backyard, I can see out there the 40 or 50 different species interacting at orders of magnitude, different rates and strength. It's a much harder mathematical problem. Yet if that backyard is producing the food for my family, we have to understand that, that mathematical problem quite quickly. Similarly, if it's a forest, that's cleansing, sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and stopping the planet heating up. We need to understand the mathematics of how that forest works and how to keep it going. Uh, but then being able to convert that into something that the, the politicians understand and, and business people can see it as something to invest in to maintain, it, it, it again requires a few more steps in, in communication. And, and so it goes across something I, I've been spending time at a wonderful place there in um, Marseille, a sort of since you advanced study there, where it's ecologists and economists interacting with each other. But an economist said a very interesting thing to me. He said, you know, we, we both make similar types of models, these nonlinear mathematical models, and, and we predict what's happening and it never seems to happen. And then when it does, it all happens much more quickly than we ever thought it was going to happen. And, and, and that's the same thing with, 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 with what we're doing to the planet. We, we can make these predictions that these things are going to happen and we think, well, when's it going to happen? And then when it does, it's much faster than we ever thought it was. And economies do the same thing because it's the same nonlinear interaction. Whereas the people who want to understand hate that nonlinear. You know, the, 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 the thing that gives you an insight into people's inability to grasp exponential growth 
is half an hour every evening on the TV and the radio, there'll be the stock report. And they say, it was a record day on the stock market. It went up 500. And it's like, for that 500 today is completely different than 500 uh, 10 years ago. It's equivalent to 50 10 years ago because this thing's in a different place because they should all be giving those reports in logarithmic numbers and things like that. But none of them would understand it if you gave it in the language that really matters that determines what it's actually doing. Do you, um, and I don't want to get too far down another rabbit hole, but do you believe that uh, emerging technologies, algorithms, AI, um, big data, blockchain, distributed ledger technology, that those are any tools or tricks for us to um, kind of help us to deal with Einstein's problem theory that we can't use the same thinking to solve our problems, but also to give us that digital advantage, that exponential advantage, maybe even get into quantum computing to help us say, nope, okay, here's how we can compute or understand that it's done in a, in a way that's a secure, smart contracts, distributed ledger technology somehow to, to help us better because we're not able to compute or to understand it fast enough to do that, to use that a, as like an extra layer or tool uh, do you think those things could... No, I, I think those things are, are vital to what we have to do, particularly for these, as I say, that what, what I see is the biggest problem with science is understanding the mathematics of natural systems. And because it's so many different species interacting at different rates in parallel, you're going to have to have massively powerful computational abilities to do that and, and new algorithms to do it. And, and to me, it's wonderful. Again, one of the people that I met at that... Um, um, in, in Marseille, it's this amazing uh, math, Italian mathematician who's written this great 900 page book on new sets of partial differential equations that will allow us to solve all sorts of different problems in, in, in computational ways we couldn't have done 10 years ago. And, and similarly, you know, understanding food webs, Bob May, when he first sort of looked at the, this relationship between species diversity and stability of webs, could do as much as he could do with his formidable mind analytically. And then he said, but I can't go to more than four or five species. But 25, 30 years later, the advances in algebra, just the analytical skills, mean we could get up to about 20, 25 species now. And that, that's a, a more realistic level of abundance, but his results still hold. Uh, we just have a stronger mathematical framework within which to look at it. Uh, and to me, the, the logical step is then you're always, it's fantastic to have that huge computer power, but you've got to use it with something where you looked at the result analytically to the level of mathematical ability to understand it before you put it in the computer and just number crunch it with the first numbers that come into your head. Understand its assumptions in a simple mathematical model of the different bits of the system before you put them together and crunch the numbers. Because crunching the numbers, it, 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 it's technologically quite straightforward, but garbage in is garbage out. So get it correct before you then massively scale it up. I totally agree with you, and um, I do believe it is a good t tool, but we also need to make sure that the, the way its input is is proper. Uh, we, we've actually been learning about this for many, many years. Uh, back in 1972, the book, The Limits to Growth, which actually started out as a paper and report, Donella Meadows, Dennis Meadows, Jörg Randers, Steve Behrens, uh, the third, uh, and Club of Rome and the Volkswagen Foundation wrote this fabulous uh, paper, which turned into a book with uh, now three or four editions. Um, it was based on systems dynamic modeling, systems thinking. A world Model 3 was the first computer model that they put this data, the mass, and let it uh, ran out multiple scenarios to, to come to this. In some ways, um, helped in, in many ways we still are kind of not not there i mean 1972 now to 2020 so um it, it's nice to hear but we've we've still got a perf wrapped our mind around uh, around 
the abilities to use some of those? I know you guys use modeling in some of your work well, as well. I, I think the essential problem there is that you know, system biology, systems thinking tends to look at how you couple different stages of a process together. And, and computationally, it's often powerful enough to do, you know, if you think of it as a food web, what's going on amongst those uh, like the, the microbiomes you, you, you mentioned, how do they affect what's happening to the plants and how does what's happening to the plants affect the things that eat the plants and how does that affect the things that eat those and all the parasites in the chain in between. We can maybe do two or three layers of that because they're, they're, they're coupled non-linearly at different rates between those different layers. Being, being able to go all the way up and come all the way back down again is it, it, still at the limits to sort of computation. Yeah, and then the thing that the, you know, the systems biology has become much more of a molecular biology thing, and it's like, well, how do the genes affect the way that this bit of the liver functions? But it doesn't go from the liver up to the human and its health and the population it's living in and what it needs to feed on. It's only going from the genes to the liver, and there's many additional steps that that it just computationally they haven't put in yet because we don't know how liver function goes to population function and yeah, that's it's very so not complex. linear step at a very different scale it's, it's not only complexity science it's just uh we're scratching on so many layers that those tools the technologies i mean even with the human genome project they were able to do it in record time computing power but within that, there still are our, our, our own biome, our microbiome, microorganisms that have a whole nother uh, yeah. uh, sequence within them that, that is, not, is, is uh, not discovered and fathomed just because we know the human genome uh, and uh, sequencing and things like that does not mean that we know what's the sub layers, the different layers that you just discussed. Um, we're, we're running close on time, so I've got a couple more questions. We could really talk for hours because uh, I, I, lo I love your mind and your work, and, and it's nice to have this dialogue. Our, our listeners are really going to love it. I want to um, kind of ask you, I don't know if you know, I'm a sustainable development goal advocate for the United Nations and right. uh, the Paris Agreement, Paris uh, 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 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals with targets and indicators. Do you believe that uh, um, that is a good plan, a roadmap, a structure to get us to December 2030 to, to help keep our planet below 1.5 degrees of warming or do you believe that there's some other kind of a global plan out there that, that we could work on that would really help us to get into a better future, uh, not only environmental problems, but human health and many other things we're dealing with at this time? I think it's the only plan we have, and it's aspirational, and its aspirations are magnificent. We just need more people to get on board with it and make even bigger efforts this time and to see COVID as a wake-up call of some of the things that are going to happen very suddenly and very quickly, as I mentioned earlier, if we don't do these things. Because COVID has been a massive economic hit as well as huge human tragedy. Uh, but um, loss of biological diversity in the ecosystems it provides, particularly as we say, clean water and soil in which to grow crops, are going to make COVID look like an upset at a kid's tea party. Uh, similarly, climate change is sitting beside that and will interact behind all these things. So, so we desperately need this sustainable development agenda to get us back on track and we need to invest in it financially, intellectually, and morally. I was going to say politically, but increasingly politics and morals don't overlap that much. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, the last hardest question I have for you is uh, similar to the burning question. It's a little bit different. And so I want to see if you have a different view of that. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? That's, a, that's an interesting question. A word, a, a, a word that works for everyone. 
still has to be this democratic world where you have a bunch of people who don't agree with each other, slowing down the rate at which we make stupid decisions, but a bunch of innovative and creative people coming up with new solutions to problems, but particularly, I mean, the sort of shiny example from this, and in many cases, the exceptional shining example among the world's billionaires is Bill Gates, who, you know, it sits behind the technological revolution that gives us like phones and everything, but saw that the world's biggest problem is malaria and neglected tropical diseases and puts all of his wealth into solving those because reducing the deaths and misery that diseases cause people throughout the world, but particularly Africa, Southeast Asia, South America, will massively empower the economies of those regions and make the world a better place. And you know, all the young new Mozarts and Beethovens and Picassos will survive because of what he's done. The other multi-billionaires pouring their money into the toilet of space exploration are just pissing it away. It really is abysmal how the people who capitalized out of COVID with everybody having their home deliveries are completely and utterly wasting the money they've egregiously gouged out of people because of it. Thank you. And they will be seen to be stupid and short-sighted because of that. Yeah, it would, it would be nice that uh, I, I don't even necessarily mind the space exploration or the home deliveries and, and those things if they would and, and invested in a resilient future. So um, the, the thing that I like about space is that it's one that's very efficient in order to survive and get back safely or to build or do anything to have energy in space. You have to be extremely resilient and efficient of every movement and usage that you have, which can really strongly be applied here on, on this earth. I'm a big fan of Carl Sagan. I I uh, interviewed his daughter here on my show recently, and uh, Sasef Sagan. But uh, we are all star stuff. We're made up of the basic elements uh, of uh, the insides of collapsing stars, and, and uh, we're part of this. Billion-year-old carbon. Yeah, mean. yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so I, I really believe that that you know there there's some there's some wisdom in that. The the last big question I have for you is. If you could go up to my listeners individually and provide them with one sustainable takeaway that would empower them or help them as startups, innovators, entrepreneurs, or people who are really concerned about how to uh, arrive in the future a little bit more resilient and, and uh, uh, have, a, have a good life, what would that takeaway or that word of wisdom that you could depart to them um, that, that, that kind of maybe make their life better or be, be something that they could put in their toolbox uh, or on their tool belt to help them uh, uh, get through life a little bit better. Go to your local farmer's market, talk to the people who produce the food, ask them that, you know, what's the way to cook this? How would you, what's a really good way to cook this? And how did you go, how, you know, how many crops a year do you, you know, go and talk to the people who produce your food and then see if they want you to come and help. Learn about where your food comes from and, and how to enjoy a healthier diet would make everybody in a better place, particularly if they saw how it was produced. Thank you so much. Um, that's all I have for you today. Right, good unless to talk you to have you. any questions for me, but uh, I really thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Andy. Cheers. Take right, care. Thank Bye. you.